Well, hello, ladies and gents, and welcome to hopefully is what is the first video from the Polyonic PC War Gamers. Um, I made this video just because uh, JTS is definitely one of my favourite games, and the, the Polyonic series is definitely right up there. Um, and we've got a sale for G, uh, JTS coming up in a couple of days' time, and they've just released the the latest update for JTS War, Campaign Waterloo, um, and it's improved it massively. There's a lot more rules in there, a lot of under the hood stuff, um, and the hand drawn maps look absolutely fantastic. And I've seen on the page that there is a few people thinking about getting it, and uh, the Polyonic uh, JTS games in general. And just in case you're brand new to the series, never played the John Tiller game before, that's who it's designed for. Others may have come from different John Tiller games. You may have been playing Seven Years' War or American Civil War or Panzer Campaigns or something like that. And you just want to see what's the difference. Um, uh, or you might just want to see how the new game plays out. It's not comprehensive by any stretch of the imagination. It's not every single uh, thing that uh, under the hood of a John Tiller game. But it'll get you going. It'll get the basics going. Um, as with all John Tiller games, you get a fantastic amount of documentation. So if we have a look in the install folder and we go down to the PDF files, um, you get notes about Napoleon and Battles, you get the notes about the game, you get a user manual, you get army lists, histor historical backgrounds and stuff like that. And it almost makes the game worthwhile in its own right, let alone having the game itself. Um, just because if you were to source that information from books and things like that, it's going to cost a lot of money and you may not get what you want. So it does put the documentation puts a lot of context to the game as well. And I strongly suggest reading through that documentation. I'm going to do the getting started scenario today. Um, that's the tutorial. Uh, I don't think I've ever played it, or not that I remember anyway. So we'll see what we got. And one of these PDFs is the getting started PDF, and it goes through the scenario as well. So if you do get stuck, have a look at that, print it off, and use it in combination with the video as well. Can't say we're going to play it as uh, John Tiller would or whoever did uh, Rich Hamilton did. Um, uh, in the actual PDF, we'll, we'll see what we get and go from there. Just want to say thank you to everyone that has joined the Facebook group since it started a couple of months back. Really do appreciate it. I think it's a nice little forum that we can all discuss a very niche corner of PC Wargaming. Um, I'd love to know what you think about this video as well, so please do leave comments in the comment section. This is my first ever YouTube video. Um, I don't know how it's going to go. We'll have to wait and see. It might be a load of rubbish. It might be quite good. We'll, we'll, we'll wait and see. Um, the other reason I'm doing this is there aren't many John Tiller Napoleonic uh, videos on YouTube at all. I had a look again this morning. There's a couple of reviews and stuff like that. There's some videos where it's just gameplay without any voice or, or narration. Um, and there's also just some videos in other languages, which aren't much used to myself, whose English is a uh, as a first language. Um, so hopefully it's filling a, a, a gap in the market, if you like. Okay, so we'll get going um, and hopefully you enjoy it. And please do leave comments, be it good, bad, constructive criticism. Um, I'm not the world's best player. I'd like to think I'm an accomplished player. I'd like to know what I'm talking about to a certain extent. So we'll see how we get on. Right, this is the first box that comes up, and this is where you get to choose your scenario that you're playing. A uh, good thing is about Tiller games that you get loads and loads and loads and loads of different scenarios. A lot of them are in the main battle, in this case Waterloo will be broken down into segments. There'll be a historical, um, when you know certain commanders appear on the field or commanders aren't there and stuff like that, just so it plays out very differently. Uh, if we just go and choose this one, it's a hypothetical one, it's a 400 turn one. Um, you always get a description of the battle itself, what's actually going on in the scenario you're going to play. It tells you who the designer is, in this case, Rich Hamilton. Um, and it lets you either play on your own against the AI, um, uh, or it also allows you to choose a PBM setup as well. So when you're playing by uh, email with another player, or you could play a two-player hot seat. That's when you both are at the same screen, and literally that you hot seat. Once you've done your turn, somebody else uh, takes a seat and does their turn. If you want to load up an old game, just go to old game um, and then choose the file that you're uh, currently playing. But we're going to go with this getting started scenario, as we said. We can see here it's a 12 turn scenario. Uh, you can adjust it. It's just 12 turns by default. If we wanted to make it a 50 turn uh, uh, scenario, we just go there. Or if we wanted to make it a 5, one, uh, five turn scenario as well, we could just go there. However, we're going to keep it at 12. 
So this scenario is created specifically to be used alongside the Getting Started Help file. That's that PDF I showed you a little while ago. And it's to help new players learn the system. Never played this one, so I'll be interested to see what we get. Um, I'm not bothered about winning or losing this one. It's purely really to get you started and tell you what everything does, where everything is, and get used to the movement in the uh, Napoleonic games. So I'm going to go ahead and say OK. Next box is this AI selection dialog. That's the next one we get. And this is when you can choose your side. We can either have full manual control of the army when you move, you fire, uh, and do absolutely everything. You can have command control. That's when you give your commanders basic uh, instructions such as attack or extreme attack or defend or extreme defend. And then you sort of press play in the turn and, and then it, it will, the AI will play it out for you. Don't particularly like it. Um, the AI is designed to give you an opponent. Uh, it's not designed to be smart or clever. Basically something to fire back at you um, rather than a human opponent. Don't really play with that. And the next two are automatic or automatic with fog of war. So that's what you would give your opponent if you're playing against the AI. The difference between the two, uh, automatic with fog of war, so it has exactly that. It has fog of war, so you won't be able to see um, anything that isn't in line of sight. The other thing with fog of war activated is if you make a mistake or um, you do something you, sh you didn't want to do, you cannot undo your last move. That's realistic because it's potentially you could just go around the battlefield and have a look at uh, all your opponent and you say, oh, I don't like that. That's too dangerous. I bumped into somebody and I'm going to undo that move. That's not realistic. The next thing then is what is sometimes referred to as the AI slider scale. It's more accurate to call it an advantage slider scale. This will not affect the AI in any way at all, any way, shape or form. What it does do is it affects the dice roll. So if we were to give the allies a, an advantage, let's say, all the way to the right, that means any time they attack you or you've got to defend against them, they get a huge advantage. Therefore, you're going to lose a lot more troops defending um, and you're not going to have as effective as an attack as you would were somewhere in the middle or if we had the French on full uh, advantage. So I'm just going to leave it somewhere in the middle there. Rules then. This is the big one. As you can see, there are lots of optional rules. I'm just going to deselect them all just so we can have a, a quick discussion on what each one does and the ones I play with and why I play with them. The biggest one, I suppose, is this manual defensive fire, whether it's switched on or off. If we have it switched on, it breaks down the play or the phases of play into eight phases. Uh, it takes a long while to do it. It's slightly more realistic to resolve combat, things like that, especially when you get the likes of opportunity fire. Um, you only get the chance to opportunity fire once, which is probably more realistic, rather than you walking across the front line and everybody and their mother starts firing at you with opportunity fire. Um, I won't go into the phases on this video. However, I will do another video later on with phases just to show the difference. Um, I'm a little bit lazy and I will keep that one switched off. I always play with victory points for leader casualties, although it's not usually on by default. That's because leaders are essential in this game. And if you were to capture them or kill them or wound them, I think you should be given points. It means you've got to take care of them. They're not just going to lead every single charge on the front line because you lose them. And then they, they get replaced with um, either a sort of a Colonel Anonymous or a, a Phantom Leader. However, we want to keep our leaders intact and they're valuable targets. And we should be rewarded whether if we are able to actually capture, kill or wound another leader. Route limiting, that refers to uh, units that route and how it affects the, uh, the units in adjacent hexes. So if you've got sort of a militia unit and a cavalry, a cavalry charge one unit, the chances are, if we have route, route limiting on, adjacent uh, and the units side by side in real life may potentially think, oh, I'm not having any of that, so I'm going to scarf her as well. However, if we put route limiting on, it reduces that chance and they get a, the adjacent units or the routing units sort of get a, a morale check um, and are less likely to have thousands and thousands of troops routing. Isolation rules is another one I play with. I like to play with isolation rules. Um, <coughs> excuse me. That means that we get um, uh, a disadvantage if an enemy happens to... Uh, 
surround us. We can't fire or attack or defend with anywhere near as much as we would if we weren't isolated. So that makes it realistic. If you're surrounded, people are going to panic. It's not going to be the best situation to be in. Therefore, we have to take a penalty for that, for getting yourself into that situation in the first place, I like to think. Uh, so therefore, I play with isolation rules twitched on. Optional fire results, that's another one I always play with. Basically, that means that when the dice is rolled, when we fire on a unit, rather than it being fairly uniform across the board, we've got 500 men firing. The chances are, uh, let's say, half the shots will hit each and every time. If we have this, it could be we hit with all 500 uh, shots. However, due to things like rain, weapon misfires, people panicking, things like that, that means that <coughs> excuse me, we might have only 50 in the second time. So optional fire results affects the fire capability, if you like, of a unit that you're using. Melee terrain modifiers is another one I'm going to play with as well. Basically, if we're meleeing uh, in a nice open hex and we're not disordered, uh, chances are if we've got a leader there, we're going to have quite an effective melee. However, if we start attacking people in towns or forests and woods or going to pass over walls into gardens and things like that, that's going to affect our melee capability. It's going to take away some of that force, if you like, from attacking people. So I'm going to take that and I'm going to make sure that that's switched on. Column pass through fire, that's to do with artillery, and when we fire on uh, a column or a line, rather than the artillery just passing through a, uh, a line, um, it's going to also affect columns as well. So I'm going to make sure that that's switched on. Target density modifier. One thing with John Tiller is that for a hex that is supposed to be 100 metres across, you can get an awful lot of units in there. I think with this one, it's around 2,000 as a stacking limit. And if we didn't have this uh, on, um, and we had multiple units within that hex, and we fired on them with artillery, then the artillery would only hit that unit. But if everybody's bunched up, and artillery being artillery, chances are some of those cannibals and some of that shot is going to actually hit the surrounding units as well. So what you'll see when we fire on, on uh, units, excuse me, when we fire on units, it's going to have a, an awful lot more strength and hit a lot more people, which is more realistic. No retreat overruns is the next one. And this is to prevent the defenders of a melee from retre retreating into hexes containing uh, enemy skirmishes. So we're going to do that because that's a little bit unrealistic. Movement threat disorder. That's another one I always play with. That's going to cause any units that are moving to, subject, uh, to be subject to the same cavalry disorder. Um, uh, essentially, what it is... So movement threat disorder, that's another one I'm going to play with. Um, and that basically means as we're moving, um, if we move a little bit too close to an enemy unit and we're not using the best quality troops, we may become disordered. We may not keep in a nice straight line. We may not be in a nice column. And if we pass over objects and things like that, we can get uh, a threat disorder as well. We like everybody to be nice and neat. Disorder gives us severe disadvantages when it comes to attacking and defending. Next rule then is this weak zone of control, and that basically allows the units to move through one hex through enemy zone of control, or allows units to retreat one hex throughout uh, through the enemy control. Partial retreats that allows some units to retreat from a hex after being defeated in melee, even if there's not enough room for all the units to retreat. Um, I think that's quite a good rule. I'm going to put that on as well. So uh, if we do have to retreat and there's no space there, we can nip into an adjacent hex, even if we didn't have the movement points for it. Line restriction movement, that's another one I'm going to play with. Uh, infantry units in the Napole Napoleonic era did not always move in lines. Um, very rarely did they, and they may have done it short distance, but certainly not moving across the map in a line. Um, they're very unwieldy. It took a lot of training and a lot of discipline and add into it all the effects of the battle itself um, and it becomes an unwieldy formation. With line movement restriction put on, it means we have quite a high chance of if we move in line, certainly over sort of obstructed terrain or in the vicinity of enemy and things like that, that we will become disordered. Um, guard units and sort of B and A ranked units uh, probably have less of a chance of disrupting, um, but it makes it more realistic. 
flank morale modifier. That's another one I'm going to put on. If we have non-skirmish units, so line infantry or light infantry or guard or, or cavalry and things like that, um, it's, it's in the day of Napoleon, you had to protect your flanks, as a lot of uh, war studies have suggested since. Flank morale modifier. That's another one that I'm going to put in there. You have to protect your flanks. If you're getting flanked and enemy infantry are coming in from the side, you are going to have a defensive disadvantage should they attack you. So that only applies to non-skirmish units, so you know guard units and line infantry and stuff like that. Optional melee results, very similar to the option fire results, rather than getting a nice uniform melee each and every time if we had those 500 men attacking, this is going to break down and say, right, well, maybe only 50 of those men were capable of um, attacking in the first place, um, but it might be the full 500. So it splits that dice roll and evens it out across the board. Multiple cavalry melees, that's another one I do play with. Um, that makes it so that if you have a cavalry charge within your turn, and it goes well, and you don't get disrupted or disordered or routed, then you can continue. However, the second time you melee will be at a disadvantage. It won't have the, the impact of the first melee. I don't play with multiple infantry melees because they'd be blown out after one single melee, and it, because it's a 10 or 15 minute turn, chances are that they would be carrying on. It wasn't as quick as a cavalry melee. No opportunity fire against skirmishers. That's another one I'm going to play with. Um, that basically means if you're moving skirmishers around, and due to the nature of skirmishers, they're going to be sort of in and out of cover, dashing around, taking pot shots at leaders and uh, officers as and when they can. So we don't have opportunity fire or defensive opportunity fire um, against skirmishers. No melee eliminations. That's going to be prevent defenders in a melee that have no valid retreat hex from being eliminated. So if you surround somebody um, and they... Um, and they disorder, they rout, and you defeat them. Rather than just disappear off the map, um, that's going to protect them, and they're still going to be on the map, and they're still going to run away as best they can. And the new one for Waterloo, for people that haven't experienced it before, came in with uh, Bonaparte's... Uh, sorry, beg your pardon. It came in with Wellington's Peninsula War. You have to have a leader present, or in the, in the vicinity, when uh, your units are going to melee. They didn't just do it off their back, their own back. Even sergeants and things like that wouldn't just say, right, lads, we're going to go and attack the French line with bayonets fixed. A leader would have to be there, um, and I'm going to put play with that. It's quite a nice rule, um, and it, again, it sort of goes back to that victory point for leader casualties. Leaders, as we'll talk about in this scenario, are very important. So, we've got our rule set. We've got everything here. I'm going to take the French just because you all seem to like the French and prefer them over the Allies. And I don't play the French anywhere near as much as I do the Allies. So I'm going to put the Allies on automatic with fog of war. Now I'm going to press OK. And there we go. So the first thing you can see if you play the older John Tiller Napoleonic games, you can see the lovely hand painted maps. They have made a hell of a difference there. Uh, this is our dialogue box, and it, it means that we are going first. It's the French turn, and it's turn 1 of 12. First glance, then, you'll probably notice that my screen looks a little bit different than yours. Um, I like to play around with graphics, so I like to mod my unit boxes and terrain boxes and things like that, just to get more of a sort of a, a tabletop feel. So, you know, we've got the, the black felt with wood and old maps or old paper style terrain boxes. Good news is that everything will be in the same place still. Nothing will have moved, all the buttons do the same thing, it's just going to look a little bit different. First thing I'm going to talk about then is the zoom modes. You can use the mouse wheel to scroll in and out, or we can come up here um, on the toolbar at the top and there's a little magnifying glasses, as with most games, and a little plus goes in and the little minus goes out. The maximum zoom, or the larger scale zoom if you like, is uh, 2D zoomed out view and it gives you a big picture. Uh, not so handy for this scenario just because it's quite a small scale or um, area of operations. So we can see everything as you can see, it's not taking up the full screen. Zoom in a little bit, but then we get a 2D sort of medium view. Um, I changed my counters, I don't like usually to play with NATO counters, especially in a, a Napoleonic era game, so I changed all my counters to represent, 
you know, cavalry, uh, supply, and infantry, etc. Skirmishes there as well. Zoom in a little bit more, we get a magnified 2D zoom view, and that's nice for people that do like to play counters rather than 3D. Zoom in a little bit more, we get a zoomed out 3D mode. I prefer to use 3D modes for combat resolution, um, and I like to use the 2D stuff for movement, especially if you're marching to contact like, over a big map. Um, it makes movement a hell of a lot easier. And zoom in the last one then, we get a zoomed in 3D mode, and as you can see, um, it's the easiest one I think personally to use for combat resolution. Down at the bottom it says we are ready to go. Um, this is a terrain box up here. So as you can see the red cursor is over this hex here. Um, and we can see that that's a field. Obviously it's not damaged with an elevation of 300 feet above sea level. And if we move it over here, that's clear terrain, elevation 300 feet. Let's have a look up on the ridge. That's 325 feet and so on and so on. We've got an orchard there and that will give you minus 10% in your fire just because it's going to be a little bit obstructed. Um, I think the biggest thing with John Tiller games is probably all this toolbar at the top um, with all the symbols, what do they do, what do they mean and quite often is the case is that you can actually find more than one place to do what you're trying to do, whether you want to move or fire. There's a hotkey usually, um, we can use the menu here, or the toolbar here, or we can go into somewhere here and change it as well. So there's often more than one place, and that can be confusing. Everybody has their own style as well. I'm going to go with the way that I do it, and I almost exclusively use the toolbar up the top here, with all these symbols and what have you. Um, Hopefully you can hear me okay, I can hear the background sounds. Uh, we can go into settings as well, and the first thing I do whenever I load up a new John Teller game, or install a new John Teller game, is take off this beep on error, because it has that awful Windows sound when you make an error, when you run out of points or something like that, or movement points and can't move anymore, it just constantly beeps at you. I don't need you to remind me um, that I'm making a mistake, basically. So I'm going to take that off. We can toggle through background music as well, trouble is with background music, it tends to, as you can probably hear, block everything out and it's quite loud. It's quite nice when you're moving on a campaign map. Say that off. It's quite nice when you're moving on a campaign map um, and it adds to the ambience and everything, but once you have combat resolution and stuff, I, I, I take it off because it tends to drown everything out. So, looking at the scenario itself. If we press J, the J key, we can see a jump dialogue, so a, a large scale map of the entire battlefield. Um, because it's such a small battlefield in this case, and you can move around by pressing the mouse, let's do that again, and the map will center on where you selected on that jump dialogue. So we can go there, press in the center map, and it will take us directly there. Um, on large scale battles, it's essential that you do that, so A, you don't miss any units, um, and to get the, the overall sort of big scale picture of what's actually going on. I wouldn't say we're going to need it that much in this scenario. Um, going across the top then, um, <coughs> excuse me, we have a move or fire mode, so any infantry or cavalry or artillery has a certain amount of movement points. That means that when we start moving or we change formation we fire upon somebody or something like that, we're going to expend our movement points. And the two modes we can go into are fire and move. So when we have infantry selected um, and we want to move, we're going to have to go into movement mode. And if we want to fire, we're going to have to go into fire, fire mode. Um, this is to do with our new battles and old battles for saving battles and new scenarios and things like that. This one here with a little sort of like clock there is your next turn. So when you've completed your move, um, then that will give your opponent their opportunity to actually go. You can't do anything after that until your opponent has actually done their turn. These ones refer to the unit facing of your of your of the unit you've actually selected. Obviously, you can already fire in the in the direction you're passing and things like that. So that's going to come into play quite a lot as we start to move our troops around, um, and that's about base. This is a very important button: change line or column. Um, so our infantry, as we'll explain in a little while, have three basic formations. We've got square, we've got line and column. Um, and that button literally changes their formation if they have sufficient movement points to do so. It also unlimbers and limbers artillery. I 
Okay, it doesn't explain it when you sort of hover over there. It says change line or column. However, it will also lumber and unlimber artillery. This is a skirmisher button or squadron. So if we've got cavalry, we can break down our cavalry into smaller squadrons. And our infantry, if they're capable of doing it, can also break off into uh, skirmishers as well. Um, only certain units can do that. Light units can do it. Guard units can do it. Line units can do it. Pioneers cannot, and Militia cannot. Um, interesting note as well, uh, Light units and Guard units, they can potentially break down the whole mother or uh, parent battalion into skirmishers, so you can break it right down. Line troops tend to only be able to put one skirmisher formation out. Okay. Um, Change square, so we can automatically go into square without having to go through um, our line, then into column and things like that. If we've got enough movement points, we can change our infantry formation into square. Change extended line, it's getting a little bit uh, advanced, but when we have a line or line formation, we can break it out and put a sort of an echelon to the right or to the left, depending on the situation. Um, and that's to do with it sometimes the amount of troops. When you're playing with Austrians and stuff like that, they've got these massive units, seven, eight hundred even a thousand men sometimes, they're not going to bunch up in, in a thousand, in a hundred meter square, so we, we would have to potentially extend that line out. Um, when we select cavalry, as long as they are not disordered, then we can change them into charging mode, um, and it gives you a massive advantage, um, as we'll hopefully see later on, uh, it gives you a massive advantage in meleeing or fighting enemy troops, rather than just attacking. Artillery dialogue, that box will open up a whole list of artillery um, where it is on the map and uh, similar to the Panzer campaigns there. However, I, I don't think personally it's as effective um, in these type of games that, that it, than it is in Panzer campaigns and things like that where artillery can be lost behind the line. Um, artillery in these type of games is very much line of sight. Um, there are howitzers and stuff like that, but it's generally very much line of sight. So I, I never really use the artillery box or artillery dialogue box. Um, later on, we're going to have to do some meleeing, um, and that's when we're in an adjacent hex. So let's say these troops here are eventually going to move up to this road and hopefully attack La, La, Se, hey, La hey Saint, um, and we have to resolve that melee. Okay, and we'll come to that later on. There are map functions, zooming in and out. Um, toggle units, this to do with how um, everything is displayed on the map. I don't really use these boxes here, just because if I really wanted to, I could come into settings, or view, sorry, and I can put unit bases off. Some people don't like playing with the bases. Um, I do, just to, I'm used to it, I suppose. Um, but you can, by all means, take off your unit bases, and it makes it sort of I say more realistic if you like, or certainly to look at. However, I do like to play with unit bases. Going further along then, we can put our leaders on the top. That is useful for identifying where your leaders actually are on the map. And it doesn't really make a difference in 3D mode, but if we zoom out, now we can start to see all these crowns are our leaders and officers in charge of squadrons and stuff like that. And we can easily see where they are. If I was to switch that off now and say, um, uh, sorry, beg your pardon. If I was to switch that off there, then we can see they go back down so you can see what type of unit is actually in that box. Or we come back here, we can see, right, there's all our leaders. Um, we can see our objectives. Objectives, as you can see here, with the objectives switched on, these little national flags, in this case the British flags, are our objectives. That's what we're trying to get, or potentially trying to get, on the map. We take those off, then the flags will disappear. However, we can actually see what's underneath them and the units protecting them. If we were to click on that hex, we can see that okay, there is a clear hex with an elevation of 350 feet, uh, and the objective is 250 points. And for this other one here, it's also 250 points. Now, I think this scenario we need 500 points to win. So that's our two. Um, that's our 500 points right there. So we're pretty much going to go for those two objectives. We're going to take hopefully some infantry and enemy with us, however they're definitely going to inflict casualties on us, um, and that's how they score. Okay, so it's not just a case of we're going to take that and win 250 points, losses are going to come into effect as well. 
Next one is line of sight or visible hexes. That's very useful for our artillery and if you want to fire on someone so you can actually see what they can see. It's not just a case of us being able to fire across the map, it's something we can see um, with uh, obstructions and terrain and stuff like that. That's really going to come into play. So we're going to have to be able to have a look at what that unit can see. Now. Next one is contours. Uh, you can see if I switch contours on, there's a, a brown line sort of indicating the edge of the hexes. It does make it a little bit clearer, um, I suppose, but we're going to have to take that into consideration, certainly for the likes of artillery. We want to be on the high ground. Um, and there's also slightly different shading on these uh, maps, so we can see there's a differentiation between different levels. That's a 300 feet hex, and you see the darker one is 325. Um, and if we go up here, it's probably a little bit more. No, and then it goes back down again. Okay, but that's what the contours do. I tend to take them off for clarity's sake. Um, we can go full screen if we really wanted to, just to take the side unit bar away. Um, I, I don't see really an advantage to it. So we can take that back off. We've got a jump map. Instead of pressing J, we can press the jump map uh, button up here, and it does exactly the same thing. Um, <coughs> excuse me, next stack, that's for the next adjacent stack that we haven't moved or fired with. Um, and these are very useful buttons as well. Some scenarios that you get, you will have fixed units that do not come into play until uh, an enemy is in either close proximity or until a certain turn number later on down the line. Um, and they remain fixed. So we could highlight them. So we press the fixed units. I doubt any of these are fixed. But what you will usually get is a little box drawn around the base of the unit to say that they are fixed. And when you click on the unit itself, um, there'll be text there to tell you that that unit is fixed. Spotted units. If we press that button there, we can see pretty much everyone here has been spotted. That's because they're now highlighted. Um, and that will depend on the unit that we've actually selected. Another important one is fired units. This uh, button will enable you to see which units you've actually fired with. This one is not too bad because there's not so many troops, but when you get into something like uh, Leipzig, when you've got half a million men on the field, and it just becomes all a bit confusing. Sometimes you need to know oh, which ones have I fired with um, and which ones can I still fire same kind of principle, this one up here looks like a little wagon wheel, that is our um, moved units, so we can see which units have actually moved across the field that don't have any points left that we've actually dealt with, um, and moved them across the map, um, and which ones we haven't, so that's quite a useful one as well. Disordered units, that's that little D box up here, we can see that any units which are disordered, again disordered units don't forget are going to put us at a disadvantage if we try and attack someone or try and defend someone, so sometimes it's better to keep them off the front line, um, put them somewhere behind you just to sort themselves out, usually with the leader, and then get back into the fray afterwards. Low or no ammo, um, we'll talk about supply carts and ammo and things a little bit later on. Um, but that, that does exactly that. It highlights any units that you don't have ammo for. And then highlight organization is the other button. That we'll There's another way of doing that. I'll show you when it comes up to leadership later on. So, the scenario itself then. So, we're at what looks like um, Wellington's left, left center. Um, and it looks like that is La Haye Saint. That's probably Papalo and then La Haye Village itself, Mont Saint John and the farm up here. Um, that's just because I sort of know the battlefield. However, if you're unsure of any battlefield, if you press the shift key, then all of the predominant places on the map will show up with the text to say that they are. So there's La Haye Saint, there's the sandpit, farm, Mont Saint John itself, Papalo and La Haye. Um, and then these two smaller villages don't really have hold any significance, so um, they don't have any there. So release shift, and then it goes there. So we are looking at Wellington's centre left here, and um, that's Papalo. Right. So next thing I'm going to do then is have a look at what I'm actually up against. What have I got to play with, and who am I against? If I select any hex with a unit in it, you get this unit box up here now. Now I know this will look slightly different, as I said, to uh, the stock sim symbols and boxes that you get 
in in the vanilla game if you like. Um, however, we can see here we've got Colonel Charlotte, First Brigade, and some line troops. This we've got some line troops. Uh, we've got another leader, some line troops, line troops, line troops, some foot artillery, line troops, more line troops. I'd say a lot of line troops here. Uh, we've got a, a uh, they call it a chariot, it's a supply wagon. Um, I'd say everybody's line troops, apart from, we've got something here. Um, there are light troops, another leader, these are all light troops. So we've got some cavalry there, so we've got some lancers, some more cavalry, some more lancers, some chasseurs chevals, same, oh sorry, there's seven tussars there. This is probably Napoleon. Yep, Napoleon and Ney. And we've got some artillery, or horse artillery there. Some deployed artillery. Some fifth hussars. And then some first and fourth hussars. So we got a little bit to play with. On the enemy side, what have they got here? Looks like some King's German Legion they've got. Some more King's German Legion. Some skirmishes in the orchard. Uh, more King's German Legion. We got here some foot, uh, foot, uh, foot regiment. I would say that's Wellington and his staff. Just got kind of staff officers there. Um, we got some more foot. Some Highlanders. They look to be lifeguards, I think. Uh, foot in infantry, horse artillery, some guard units. More guard units. Like coal stream, no, they're not coal stream. They're coal stream guards. Uh, more guards, <laughs> more guards, more guards. Right, so there's a lot of guard infantry. Um, it looks to be a historical scenario. Then no one's quite where they're supposed to be. I can see that from the sand pit. We've got what looks to be just normal foot regiments there, where that was the 95th. Um, there's no Black Watch, there's no Gordons or anything like that, and they're all being replaced by guards, and they look like Dragoon Guards. Never mind, we'll play what's in front of us, that's no problem at all. Um, however, if you were to play the real Waterloo, or any real battle in the historical version, it is bang on the nail um, with John Tiller Games as to who is uh, present. Uh, they're all in the right place, they're all in the right numbers, it is bang on historical accuracy. So. We'll go through a unit there then. So, to select a unit, we can either click on a hex with the left button once, um, and that we can then have a look and click on him. And on your boxes, it will look slightly different. I always find the the uh, default way that it shows a selected unit or an unselected unit was a little bit hard to see. So what I did is I made it so that a nice blue or coloured box goes around any infantry that I've actually, or any unit that I've selected. So I can click on and off for being selected and unselected. This one's got two, it's got the unit, um, uh, the line infantry and the leader. So what I can do is select the leader, or I can select both, or deselect both. So that's one way of selecting units. Another way I can select is by clicking on any hex, so there's three units in here if you like. And to select all of those units, I can double click the left button, and now they are all selected. We'll talk about movement in a second. There's several different ways, as I said, um, to do things, and movement is uh, one of those things that is key um, and takes a little bit of explaining. Some people say that this is a click vest, and I suppose to a certain extent it is, but once you get used to everything, where everything is, it becomes second nature. Muscle memory kicks in. Uh, and before you know it, it, it's not a chore to actually do it. Okay, but once you're learning the ropes, it is a little bit of a click fest, I will admit. However, um, as I said, you soon get used to it and you'll be moving massive, massive armies across the map before you know it. So, these are some line infantry units, and in the Napoleonic Wars, skirmishers played a hell of a, a, a more important role than they would have done in. The American Civil War or the Seven Year War. So uh, it's quite important that we get our heads around skirmishes. These are usually the guys that were the smallest, the most nimble, um, and the best marksmen. They go out and be a vanguard, skirmish with enemy skirmishers, protect flanks, protect artillery, um, and things like that. So it's important that we get some skirmishes. So with a line unit, 
if we were to select there up in the box you can see can deploy. That means that this unit can deploy skirmishers, but because they're line, it's a line unit, they can only dis um, deploy one formation of skirmishers. If we were to select over here with the light unit, remember what I said that these, this light unit and guard infantry can actually break down their whole parent uh, regiment into um, skirmishers if we want it. So what I'm going to do is select this unit and then have the, press this little S up here, change skirmisher to squadron. Once I press that, you can see that 79 of the men broke off and are now skirmishers. They are basically two units within the same box. Now, I want to move these skirmishers ahead of the parent uh, formation, so I'm going to select. And the easiest way to move is basically to right click onto an adjacent hex. We couldn't right click over here, for example, and then the skirmish would shoot up there, although that is possible. I'll show you that later. If I was to select or right click on this hex, now that skirmisher will move there. However, that's going to take up movement points. Everything we do in a John Teller game is going to take up movement points. And that depends on the terrain, um, if they're disordered, if they're tired, if there's a leader present, the um, proximity to enemy units and things like that. It's not all a case of we, we get 10 points and it's going to cost 3 points to move to an adjacent hex. For example, if we were to move up the road, it's going to take a lot less points because it's easier to move on roads than it would going across the grass. So, got my skirmisher selected. And my skirmish unit selected, I'm going to right click there, um, and then he's moved into that box there. We've still got seven points remaining, so what I can do is move into that hex, and now I want to skirmish or fire upon this little guy or the King's German Legion in the orchard. With skirmishers, we don't have to worry about the direction that they are actually facing. They can sort of fire through 360 degree arc, whereas the likes of line troops or troops in column must only fire in the direction that they are actually facing. So, two ways I can do this. If you can see the cursor there, it's a little black crosshair. That means we're in movement mode. So any time that we do something with this guy, um, it's going to be in movement mode. To change into fire mode, I can either come up here and press the move fire mode, the little crosshair, and the crosshair has now changed into a crosshair. Um, or I can deselect that, go back to movement mode, and I tend to keep my cursor or, or mode of operation in movement mode because you're going to spend a lot more time moving people around than you are firing. And I hold the control key, it does exactly the same thing. So that's the hot key for changing between movement mode and full firing mode. Now, if I put the little crosshair over this skirmisher here and I right click, my skirmishers will now fire on that skirmisher. So, had no effect. That's because he's in nice uh, protected terrain. Um, he's got lots of cover there. And we've only got 79 men with a, a B quality unit. I would expect him maybe to have one target, uh, one kill or something like that, but never mind. I'm going to go to this unit now, and I'm also going to select him. Press the S button for skirmishers. My skirmishers will automatically select when I've done that, and I'm going to move them across and behind. Now what you saw there is I could move that skirmisher freely around and the other, the enemy skirmisher did not fire upon my skirmishers or anybody else for that matter, the artillery, because I had that, uh, the skirmisher optional rule, no opportunity to fire against skirmishers. If I had that rule deselected, then what you'd have found is this artillery up here, possibly that artillery and some other troops, would have actually fired on these skirmishers as they moved. But they're moving around, dashing in between cover and things like that, so they wouldn't have uh, been easy to hit anyway. Right, so I'm behind this guy now, and I'm going to do the same thing. I'm going to hold down the control key, right click, and again, no effect. Not doing very well with these guys. So, I'm going to move this line formation forward, and they've got a leader. So hopefully any attack that they carry out, especially a melee attack with the leader there, um, is to be quite an advantage over whether that leader wasn't there. What we can do, and we can't just put any leader with any unit, or we can, however it's a lot more effective to keep the relevant leaders with their relevant divisions and regiments. If we go up here and we go to view, 
and we go down to division colors we can see now that our counter or, or our um, unit boxes have changed color we've got pinks and purples and reds and things like that that or, or the colors respond to each of the divisions colors so when it gets a little bit chaotic and there's been a lot of attacking and things like that and you want to do a bit of organization maybe during the night and stuff if it's a long scenario um, or just to keep everything in check and make sure the right leaders are with the right units we can go onto division colors um, and then have a look and make sure that everybody is where they should be or the leaders should be where they should be um, I don't usually play with that switched on but it is something useful and go back to view take off division uh, colors so I'm going to move these troops up in line formation on the road. Remember where we had the line disruption um, option rule uh, highlighted. So potentially, once we start moving in line, um, we may get disordered, but we'll, we'll see. So to select these two units, I'm going to double click on the left button, right click on the adjacent hex of the road, and we can see there, because they weren't skirmisher units, um, that skirmisher could have an opportunity fire against them. So I'm going to fire now with my line infantry on that skirmisher. And we got one man, and because the phases are all automatic and it's not in manual defense fire, it's all sort of simultaneously, rather than breaking down each phase, they got another defensive fire shot at us as well. I'll show you how to melee now. So, even although we've fired, and it says up here has fired, and we've got some fatigue with that as well, even though it's fairly minimal, um, what we can do is if we have fired, we can melee after. But if we have meleeed first, we cannot fire straight, uh, we cannot fire again with that unit until the first turn. So we can melee after firing, but we cannot fire after melee. And to do that, we're going to make sure we've got both these units selected. I'm not going to press right click in this or control right click in this case. I'm going to keep it on movement mode. Make sure both these units are selected, everybody that we want to melee with. Right click there, and it goes into unknown melee odds. If we had, um, well, we did not have Fog of War on, you would get a dialog box now with the probable outcome and. Uh, strengths, if you like, of the units attacking, so my units, and the pro probable strength of the units I'm attacking. However, we don't know that for certain. We've got Fog of War. We, there is only skirmishes in there. However, we're not entirely sure with the terrain that he's in and everything like that. We're, we're taking more of a chance, which makes it a little bit more realistic. So press OK. They get a defensive fire shot. Took five of our men away. Um, however, you'll see now that nothing actually happens. So we have to go back up here to that Resolve Melee button. Once we press that, it will automatically uh, roll the dice and resolve that melee. Whether we win, whether we lose, we'll see what we get after that. What you can't do is go around the map and basically do this on a large scale. You've got to do each melee in turn. So if these troops here were somewhere up here, all in line and adjacent hex, we couldn't do multiple melees. We have to deal with one melee at a time. So, resolve. So, as you can see, we took seven of them, and they got, uh, sorry, they took seven of us, and we took one of them. They're in, they're in really nice protected ter uh, territory there. Um, it did have an effect, though, of disordering them. So that's a nice thing. We maybe pushed some of them back. Um, maybe the leaders, run and panicked and things like that so we have disordered them. what did it do to us it also disordered us as well um, and it put our fatigue up as well no problem so because I've moved and fired these units we can go back up here and we can see a red box around these units now that we've fired with um, and if we go into the fired units we can also see that they fired and we fired as well all right I want to move these guys up um, I'm going to move them across here and try and get round behind, even though there is some artillery there. But before that, while well, I see that artillery, it reminds me about our artillery. There we go, we've got some artillery there. Some foot artillery. Now, 
these are all ready unlimited. You can see we've got eight guns, quality B, um, and they are ready to go. They haven't fired, and we get to have a shot with them, if you like. Um, we can go to the visible hexes button at the top there, and now we can see what the artillery sees. So we can see these units up here, uh, we can see the units there. Can't see anything behind the ridge, obviously. Um, and anything in the in the shadow sector or the the unhighlighted areas, if you like, we cannot see. Therefore, we cannot fire on. So with artillery, what I'm going to do is press the control button, hold it down so I get my cursor back, and I'm going to fire up on these guys up on the ridge. Okay, we took four of them in. Not too bad. Um, where else have we got some artillery? We take off physical hexes. We've got some artillery back here as well. Some horse artillery. We select that horse artillery. Double click, left button. Um, and they can see some boys up on the bridge as well, some white guard. So I'm going to fire on these guys. No effect. Okay, fair enough. There's some guys right next to them. Again, right click, put artillery. Okay, managed to get one that time. Some artillery here as well. Uh, they can see these guys. So we can have another go at them. And we took away three guys. We took away three guys that time. And uh, take away that pistol Texas. So now we can see that the, their boxes are highlighted in red. That means they fired. Artillery only gets to fire once per round. Um, and we also have some artillery here that is limbered. So some horse artillery. Now to move them around, it's the same as we would for any unit. Um, they're now highlighted because of that blue box. And I'm going to move them across the field, on the road, down here. You can see as we moved, because it was on a road, the movement points went down um, a lot slower than they would have done in obstructed terrain and uh, hexes and things like that. And that. That's fairly logical. It's going to use less movement points going on a nice paved road or dirt roads than it would going across a muddy field, for example. So they moved. Um, I moved them there because my intention is to give some support to the left there. I'm trying to get around here and build up a bit of a force here. Okay. Um, cavalry then. Let's deal with cavalry. So here we've got our 7th Hussars, real nice units, a double star at 100%, masses of them, um, as with all cavalry in Waterloo, probably a little bit excessive. However, we want to break down our cavalry into squadrons, very, very similar to what we do with our infantry, um, and we can break them down into smaller chunks, into squadrons, if you like. So to do that, I'm going to make sure I select my cavalry, come up here, the little S button, skirmish your squadron, play that off and we can see there we've now got 112 men in one of the squadrons um, and we can move them around the map accordingly. So I'm going to make sure that Bruno goes with that squadron, click on the right X and make sure that Marbo is stuck or stays with the others. Now you can see there we got opportunity fired against from the artillery up here. Um, one word of note with artillery um, and why I didn't fire on that artillery that's there, that battery there. In the Polyonic Wars, they didn't really, or artillery battery did not really conduct counter battery fire. It was a bit of a waste of ammo. They were hard targets to hit, and I always think you're better off targeting. Um, enemy infantry. Even if you don't take um, or don't um, kill or injure a lot of their troops, uh, I think we've got a, a turn of one and three there, you are all the time building up their fatigue. So fatigue, that once it gets high enough, it can cap out, it's around 900, um, but once it, uh, it caps, or sorry, once it increases, they're far more likely to be disordered, they lose their combat effectiveness. So even if you don't take uh, or administer casualties, you are still having a marked effect on those units. You can even cause them to rout, okay, without actually getting close enough to fire them with artillery and things like that. So we've got some more cavalry here, some chasseurs de cheval, so uh, I can break those down into squadrons as well. And get a squadron of 93 men. 
just spread my cavalry a little bit. And we've got no cavalry on our left here, on our flank. So another way to move, okay, we've only got seven moving points here, is rather than right clicking on each adjacent hex as uh, and add to that click fest mentality, what we can do is double click with the left button, hold that left button down, and drag the cursor to the hex that you want them to go to. So I've double clicked left button, I've, do I've moved the cursor over this open down here, and the cavalry will do their best to pathfind their way there. Fair enough, it was, it was quite straightforward, they only had to sort of turn left and go over the field there. But they didn't quite reach the hex that I wanted them to go to. That's because their movement points were uh, expended before they actually got there. So just to show you that again, with these guys, double left click, keep the left button down, and we'll move them to the hex behind. Let go left, mouse button. Um, and then they move to the adjacent hex. They did stop because they had opportunity fire against them. But if they do have enough movement points, we'll see in a second, to carry on. No, they don't in this case. These guys, double click. Move them there. Double click. Move them there. The only thing with that, I would suggest, is when you start moving like that, and um, holding the, the left button down, the pathfinding sometimes infuriates you. Um, for example, if I was to move some ca uh, cavalry up here, um, and the pathfinding may go through the infantry, and that has the annoying, well, realistic, uh, but infuriating when it catches you off guard, um, has the annoying effect of actually disrupting both the cavalry and the infantry that are in there as well. Who you imagine? It's a hundred meter hex with in, uh, a couple of hundred infantry and a couple of hundred horses all running around. It's going to be chaotic. You're going to disorder. So just be wary of that. Another way we can move, um, and I'll just show you here. Um, I'm going to move Saul up here. Is we can hold down the left, so the out button. And we can hover over a hex up here, let's say. And I press the right button. They instantly, or almost instantaneously, went up to that hex that I wanted them to. Swings and roundabouts with that one. Um, it's good for moving units across uh, a road or something like that in line when you sprung out on the march. Rather than clicking each individual unit, you can get the lead unit in the column. Um, and uh, uh, lead the unit in the column and then just press the out on the right button and the whole column will move according to the movement points um, of the leader of whoever's in that column and it, it expediates moving large formations across on the road. However, it's always dealt by or always uh, decided by the lowest common denominator that is, that is actually in all the units that you're moving. So imagine you had supply wagons, imagine you had cavalry and skirmishers and you know, each type of unit strung out across the road. Some of them can move a lot more within one turn than other units. So for example if you've got units in line and you've got some cavalry, the cavalry can be able to move a lot further. However they'll be limited by the number of movement points that can be exerted by the line information. So it's a little bit tricky that way. Um, I wouldn't use it day to day small scale like this certainly. Um, although I still do. Um, it's much, much easier to use large formations or move large formations on a map using the um, out or the alt button um, and right clicking where you want them to go. Another unit we should have a look at is supply units. Very, very important. Ammunition um, is expended by, uh, by firing, obviously. Um, and your, all your units, your uh, line infantry and infantry units, must be resupplied by a supply wagon. Artillery, on the other hand, takes into account a, uh, a communal pool, if you like, a general pool of artillery ammo. Not entirely realistic, but that's just what goes on. So when artillery fires, I can really show you this turn, but you can see here on the left, that ammo here is referring to how much artillery we have or artillery ammunition we actually have for all our artillery pieces and they magically spread it out amongst each other. 
Uh, however, your infantry units aren't quite the same. They must be supplied by a, uh, a supply wagon. Um, and a supply wagon can actually automatically supply any unit within five hexes of that unit. So that's quite useful. What I have found with uh, the new Waterloo update and the Wellington's Peninsula War is that the the wagon drivers, if you like, are big old scary cats. They, they tend to route if they get too close to an enemy formation. Um, whereas before in other John Tiller games, you might sort of walk up your supply wagons quite close to the front line, just behind the infantry, just so they're there. What you find now is you should be a lot more careful with them because when they route, in my experience, I've never seen them unroute and come back into the fray. Um, and then you've got to walk your infantry up to your supply wagons rather than um, bringing your supply wagons to the front line. Um, it happens on the dice roll, it happens sort of behind the scenes, if you like, under the hood, um, as to who gets supplied and, and when. Just because you've got a unit out of supply doesn't necessarily mean they will supply um, automatically, just because even if you're within that five hexes. Um, when you have a unit with low ammo, obviously we won't probably have anybody with low ammo at the moment. Um, as long as they have low ammo, they cannot offensive fire. So you cannot fire upon anybody. But if somebody moves into opportunity fire range or somebody attacks you, they will have kept a couple of musket balls ready to um, defend themselves. Okay, they're, they're pooling their ammo, they're spreading it around. You know, three shots left, so and all that sort of thing. Um, however, if they've got no ammo, then um, obviously they can't defensive fire either. What you'll sometimes find in a, in a scenario is that, let's take these guys here, is um, they may have fired what, what one shot it was. They had one volley there, um, and they will automatically, or, or as soon as they've done that, go into low ammo. Um, other units, you could have maybe 10, 15, 20 turns before they get into low ammo. That's quite realistic because not every single formation has got the same amount of balls, um, big pardon the pun. Um, the same amount of ammunition um, uniform across the board. You know, these guys might have 10 balls per person, Th these guys might have 15, these guys might have only had one shot by the time they formed up and things like that. So it does make it realistic. However, it does catch you out. You know, it's the start of the battle, you had one shot and it goes to low round. What's going on there? Okay. Right. What else do we have to look at then? Right, I'm, I'm just basically going to play um, and then. As and when things crop up um, within the game, just explain them a little bit. So these guys give us some more skirmishers. Uh, or they, they, we can't with them because they have um, already deployed. So that can deploy has gone. Therefore, we've got to move them in a line formation. However, I'm going to change them into column then. So the little sort of silhouette of Napoleon. Change them to column, and you can see there it took quite a few movement points to do that. That's almost 400 men that they've had to wheel around and get back into formation. Um, and then hopefully we can. No, we don't have enough movement points. However, we will be able to move them the next time around. Um, these line troops, we're going to get some skirmishes there and move the skirmishes forward. They became disordered now, so that disorder threat movement there. Um, as they move forward, uh, for whatever reason it was, because of proximity to other units and stuff like that, or the enemy and across the terrain, and proximity to leaders and things like that, they actually disrupt. So they're not going to be anywhere near as effective, that's why they lost a lot more movement points as well. I'm going to change these guys into column. Because they moved, or they did something, then we get that opportunity to fire. Um, get some skirmishes here. Move them up towards the farm. Fire on these guys. No effect. Change the parent unit into column. I'm going to move them out. Some more skirmishes. I'm going to have a lot of skirmishes in this game. Um, some people don't like to use them, and it all depends on the situation. It's unrealistic if every single formation in your entire army, or who you're controlling, put out skirmishes and basically had mass skirmish lines. They weren't quite used like that. Um, and interestingly, the British, they, they never really had many skirmishes at all. Um, in the sandpit, where the 95th should be, 
That was about the only skirmishes that the, the British had deployed, and then Spain as well. They would tend to be using vanguard as scouts and things like that. Whereas even, um, were they Highland Light Infantry somewhere there? No. Um, but even other light infantry formations didn't really tend to skirmish. They tended to have um, everybody formed up at the back in line, even though they were a light infantry battalion and stuff like that. Uh, so they disordered as well. We might be able to fire on these guys here. Now because skirmishers were usually invariably armed with rifles uh, rather than a musket and the rifle had an effective range of about 400 yards something like that uh, whereas a musket 100 yards tops or something like that um, we may be able to fire on more than one hex or maybe even more than two hexes away it all depends same with artillery a 12 pounder is going to have more of a range than a, a six pounder for example um, and what we can do, once you start getting into it a little bit more, is go to the help file up here and have a look at the parameter data. It tells you everything about the scenario you're playing, when night time is, what the values of everything is and things like that. Um, and if we go right to the bottom, or somewhere nearer the bottom, what we can see is weapon data. So the weapon data for a 12 pounder cannon, for example, um, will deal a damage of, of 10, or the 10 on the dice if you like, at one hex, at the adjacent hex. Obviously it's going to be more accurate, they're going to feel the force of it if they're right up on you. Um, 7 at 2, 5 at 3, and so on, and so on, and so on. Howitzers, 9 pounders, British musket, so they can fire at 2 hexes. British rifle can fire at 4 hexes. Uh, I think French, yeah, the French don't have a rifle as such. Um, however, they've got a, a value of 1 at 3 hexes. So that's how you'll be able to see how far you can actually fire. And you can combine that with your visible hexes to see your line of sight and to see what you can actually fire on in the first place. So we've got 3 hexes there. We might as well have a go at this guy in the sandpit. And a range of exceeded uh, 1, 2, 3. Okay. Um, range of exceeded, range of hex is more than we can fire. Never mind, not the end of the world. Um, so, get some more skirmishes here. This guy should be able to. There we go. But they're in nice cover down in that sandpit, um, so we're not really able to inflict any damage that time. Get them in column. Move them up. Get these guys. Move up. Um. Yeah, there's some artillery there, so we'll get some skirmishes. Um, put them in column. Now, light infantry, we can continue pressing skirmisher all the way through, and we can basically break up the whole brigade into skirmishes. So we've got three lots of skirmishes there. Now, if I wanted to put them back into the parent unit and, and join back up and, and uh, not have them skirmishes, if you like, if I select them and I am in the same hex as the parent unit, simply by pressing skirmisher again, those units go back in. But they're light units, and I am going to make sure um, we move everybody. Never mind. You've got to be careful, as I said, moving large infantry formations in line, just because they're unwieldy. Probably because they were uh, A, quality troops, they were well drilled, well disciplined, with good leadership maybe, um, they didn't disrupt them, or they didn't disorder. Put some skirmishes into the field. And same again. Get these guys into column. These guys into column, into column, into column. Oh, and skirmishers around here. These guys into column. So we got some guard skirmishers over here. All right, need a bit of a plan of attack. All right, I'm going to take these cavalry. We're going to move them up the road just because he looks fairly open on that um, uh, the left of his. Don't know what's behind the ridge. Doesn't seem to have much cavalry showing. I would have expected more. Um, but we're going to move these cavalry 
up this road uh, up here. And Sol and Pail are going to take care of that for us. So, because we've got all these units here, um, what I'm going to do to make it easier and quicker, I'm just going to click on that stack. I'm not going to select anybody, I'm just going to click on the stack in general, so the stack's highlighted if you like. I'm going to hover my uh, cursor over that hex that's right in the soul, hold down right, and everybody moves up like that. Makes it a lot easier rather than clicking each individual hex um, or each individual unit and moving them one by one. So there's a little bit of a shortcut there. Um, supply wagon, that's fine. Shack and all. He can move up with them as well. He's going to come over here and add a little bit of leadership to the cavalry that I've got going over there. We'll keep some cavalry in the centre. And that's pretty much that turn done for now. Um, I suppose we can move some guys here forward. Um, I'll put them in column. I'm not going to bother with skirmishers. Nice. Here. And here. So that's pretty much all we can do for this turn. Um, we've got some pioneers there. Pioneers is another type of infantry unit we haven't come across. Not really uh, effective combat units um, unless you absolutely have to. Um, but what these guys can do is build bridges. And it's a little bit different, I think, from what I've heard and experienced of building bridges. Um, I don't think we've got a river here with a bridge. Um, but they can repair bridges as long as they are facing the bridge um, and they're protected. They, they do take a while to do it. Um, another word of note on bridges um, is that not everything can pass every single bridge. You might have a little footbridge or you might have a big stone bridge where artillery and cavalry can freely move across. Um, but on a bridge hex, much like we would on any hex up here, it will tell you what that bridge support is and what uh, it won't tell you what can pass well, that's in the parameter the data but it goes to say that big heavy artillery lumps would need a bridge of some 150 whereas infantry might just need a foot bridge with a with a, uh, a bear, uh, uh, rating if you like of about 50 and they'll be able to pass so it, it, not everybody can pass over every single type of bridge so pretty much done with that turn, so what I can do now is come up here and press the next turn. And because it's the first one uh, that we played, all that just uh, started, uh, we'd have to uh, we'd have to select it. Okay, so now it's Wellington's turn. And Wellington or your opponent automatically does their turn. It's an opportunity fire there, as you can see, just because he's doing a bit of interest. So we get everybody off. We can speed up the movement phase, if you like, of his turn by pressing F8. Press F8. There we go. It's a little bit quick, or we can slow it back down. But it won't change though. Okay, so we can see we've got three units disordered, one unit, one unit routed. Okay, um, and okay. So when I press F8 there, what happens is that the movement phase, um, or Wellington moving all his troops around and stuff like that, that went a lot quicker. It won't affect the rate in which they fire, so the, the, the fire phases, if you like, they won't get affected, they still go through at the normal speed. Alright, what happened there then? So, we've got some skirmishes there, and what we're going to do is just, as I said, play on as if... Uh, it was a real game just explaining what's going on as I'm going to do it. So we might as well get kicking off with some artillery for this turn then. So let's start with this guy up here. We go to visible hexes. And on this hex here, if I select this hex, we can see that he's somehow decided it's a good idea to put 900 odd men there um, and the uh, artillery there as well. Because we've got the rule column de uh, or density modifier rule, they're going to take an awful lot more casualties 
than if we didn't have that optional rule. I'll show you what I, uh, option rule selected. I'll show you what I mean by that. So I'm going to go back to my artillery and double click it so it's selected. I hold down the control button so it changes my cursor and then right click. Then I get a new dialog box open. Now I have a list of the units that are in that box and just hopefully just about see the silhouettes um, which is because of when I use uh, my tiles they're not as clear. But that's the silhouette of a cannon so we don't try um, in general to do any counter battery fire and there are two line units or two infantry units that are in column. So I'm just going to select that first one there. And what you can see is we took six men and we also took three men. So we took six men uh, from that initial unit that we had uh, targeted, but because of the accuracy of the, uh, and the, the fact that they're of artillery and the fact that they're all punched up and stuff like that, we also managed to take three of the others as well. So nine men in total. If we didn't have that target density modifier selected, it would have just been the six men of the ones we actually physically targeted. So it is a more realistic rule. Same with this guy. I hold right click or hold out down, control down, and right click. Same thing. And this guy. Okay. Don't have any other unnumbered artillery but these guys. Nobody's bunched up. However, we've got some sending staff forces. Okay. Um, I'm not going to bother with the staff officer, they've only got what, 50 odd men. Um, could be Wellington, I'm not going to risk it. Or not take a chance on it. What I'm going to do is have a go at this piece of infantry up here. Okay. Take away visible hexes. Right, we'll sort ourselves out of the farm. Okay, so it'd be nice to get those cavalry around here while he's unlimbered. Give him a chance to get those guns while they're not doing anything. Uh huh, that's why I can't move. So, because I was lazy, didn't pay attention, I've actually got some of those routed skirmishes from the farm, uh, from that say Hain. They've actually gone all the way back here. I mean, that's way more than the movement points they would have had. However, that, that was that limiting um, option rule that was in effect there. And they basically escaped to anywhere they can. So, I'm going to have to get rid of them. I'll get them out of the way. They can't go closer to an enemy. Don't allow us to do anything. However, we'll get the cavalry out of the way. Finally. It would be nice to get into some cover, so what I'm going to do is these line troops. Let's get ready to put them into cover the next time. These skirmishers, they can go in cover. And then, um, what we can do, we'll have a go. Changing direction then, that's something we have actually haven't done, it's all been sort of automatic as we've moved and stuff like that. If I want these line troops in column formation to fire or to melee with this skirmisher down here, I'm going to have to change their direction. As with everything, because it's a movement, it's going to cost movement points, and usually, uh, as long as you're not in sort of obstructed terrain and disordered and things like that, we can move an infantry unit formation, uh, heading uh, by pressing this button up here, counterclockwise or clockwise, or we can go about face, but it will take three minutes to move. So, if we moved, we're subject to that opportunity to fire. So we might as well have a go with these skirmishers, just to show you. And um, we haven't actually meleeed yet. So, oh we have, very far. So, we'll have another melee with these guys. We've fired, therefore we can melee. Remember, we can't melee, then fire. Right click on the hex. Unknown melee is. Come up here and resolve them. Okay, so we got them out of the way. However, it did take seven of our guys to do it. And they are uh, still disordered. Okay, so we're going to move up to the farm here. These guys now have full movement points. Move them up to the road. 
move the skirmisher up here. Um, because there's more than one unit in this dialogue box, we have to select which unit we want to fire on. It's not like artillery where you can fire with infantry or skirmishers on every single unit within that box. You have to pick one and they will only fire on that unit. So no effect. Right click. With melee though, unlike fire uh, that, you, that you can only fire with uh, against one unit in the box of infantry, with melee you will attack everybody, or potentially everybody that is in that hex. So we're go basically going to attack with bayonets both of those skirmishing units that are in there. We don't know what's happening because we've got fog of war, we don't know the odds, should I say, and we can resolve that. So we pushed them back, um, however we didn't actually take anybody with us, that's not a problem at all. Push these skirmishes out here. Now, because we got a little bit closer, because we've actually gone face to face with them, instead of being an unknown unit, we can actually see that it's the South Lincolnshires and the Cambridgeshires as well. I'm not entirely sure what they're doing here. However, um, we can start to see the units as we go. Still can't see who that officer is, though. Never mind. Uh, him up here. So skirmish line, and we'll bring these boys up. Um, he's got a lot going on there, so we'll need them up there. We can supply them up the other way. Okay, we'll bring our horse artillery. Definitely the cover on that left, or our left. So, he's bringing the heavies in. Right, that's interesting. I'm going to leave these back here just because we're going to have to go into square now. I think that's a formation that I'm pretty sure it wasn't in the American Civil War. Cavalry was used a lot different in the age of Napoleon, especially heavy cavalry and stuff like that. Um, if they come over this ridge now and they have clear line of sight and a clear run to our skirmishers and to our infantry, as they are like this in line here and column there, they're going to probably get decimated, especially if they can charge. Um, so we're going to have to go into a square formation. I'm not going to do it just this turn, just in case they don't actually come over the hill. Because in square, square formation, it's very defensive formation, really, really useful against cavalry. Um, uh, it's a defensive formation against cavalry, but it's very vulnerable to infantry, especially infantry line, and also artillery as well. So if you imagine you're punched up. Um, it, it, it is quite a vulnerable formation. Um, and then especially if you get disordered in any formation, um, you cannot change the formation so you're sort of stuck in that square, very unwieldy to move, and though you can move one hex in square in general, um, it's only to really be used against the uh, against cavalry when they're in proximity. What we can do though is put a skirmish line out, and bring the skirmish line up, uh, just to give ourselves a little bit of protection just so we can get these guys organised. Yeah, Dolan, you get up there, the lads. Um, and what I'm going to do is bring up my lancers. Uh, yeah, lots of lancers here. I'm going to break them down into a squadron just because it's 400 there, so many of them. Um, and then we're going to move them up just to uh, protect our infantry, just because I'm wary of those guys coming 
down there. Um, Lance is nice against uh, infantry and against heavies as well. And we all know what happened. Yep, they're not around, Scott's Grace. Um, however, we all know the story there and what happened at Waterloo. Um, we've got Ney there. Uh, I'm going to bring up Ney onto that right flank somewhere up here. Just to give to bolster them a little bit, to give them a little bit of leadership. Um, and hopefully, because he seems to be moving down there, although he's got some. Oh, they look like King's German Legion there. Um, just so that uh, it bolsters them up here. Go forward with the infantry. Okay, so we can't fire in them because you can't see them. So if we go up and here. Yep, they're behind the ridge, as per Wellington does. So we can't actually see them. Continue to bring the cavalry up here, so that was right. Pressing the out key um, and then hold it, uh, and then clicking the right button, mouse button, on where we want the cavalry to end up. And hopefully they'll pass by and all the way along the road, but they won't actually reach there if they don't have enough river points. They did. Happy days. Um, what else we got? Pioneers there. Um, uh, supply wagon. I suppose we ought to bring that up a little bit. And that's about all we can do for this turn. So we'll see what Wellington does now. Uh, uh, as many of you know, the AI isn't perfect. Um, it's, it's there to provide you with an opponent, something to fire back at you if you don't have a, a an online opponent or something like that. So you can see all sorts of crazy things with the AI. I mean, he's bunched up here. Uh, eventually, what we'll probably see is when these guys go into square, if this cavalry come, they will attack square. They will attack square. Um, which really, really wouldn't have happened. But there we go. So let's go next turn. Okay then, so that King's German Legion um, in the Hussars, they came pretty much out of nowhere um, and caught us all in column. So what happened to these guys, they're going to be disordered, yep, um, however, we've got a nice opportunity now for them, but look at it, there's nothing much up there to come round on his left flank. Uh, what happened down here, there's something meleeed around here, no problem. Um, and that cavalry got this is here. Not a problem. So what we're going to do is always, as with every turn, start with our artillery and see what they can see. Uh, annoyingly, they can't see that artillery. These guys are bunched up in uh, what's that? Six, seven hundred men. Um, but we've also got this cavalry here, which is four hundred. So I might have a pop at this cavalry up here. <laughs> Forget it's only four men out of that 400 odd that they had, however, um, it's all building up their fatigue and making them less combat effective as well. These guys can see that cavalry, I'll have a go at them, select either one which you want. It's not like infantry though, when you fire on cavalry, um, when there's more than one unit in a hex, um, it, you will only fire at one unit of cavalry and it will be spread. The fire will be spread only to that unit, not spread out as an in infantry. Have another go at them. Oh no, no, oh, it's because we're not facing that target. We can see them. If we look down here, 
it says firing unit is not facing target, so we can't see. Uh, if you ever wonder which unit you or which direction your unit is facing, there's always a little arrow in the unit information box. You can see they're sort of facing up towards the top left of the screen, if you like. Um, and if we were to zoom out on your counters, um, I know my counters all have these red arrows, but you will also have an arrow indicating the direction of the facing of your unit as well. Um, can be a little bit tricky, especially when you've got a lot of infantry and stuff all stacked up on top of one another. Um, if you've moved them and you've got disordered and routed units and things like that, it can be a little bit tricky. Um, so I would suggest, um, if it doesn't make sense here and you can't see your units, every time uh, we've got any more than one, yeah. Uh, so we can see that these guys are both facing the same direction, however we can at any time change it, um, and that's quite important, the unit facing. So go back to this artillery, what can he see? So he can see these guys bunched up here, so I'll have a crack at them. So we've got a routed unit, um, and so okay. this artillery here. They look like they're bunched up, a nice juicy target. Okay. I'm going to start with the left wing over here. Strangely, they've come out of the farm, which they had, so I'll find them very much. Um, and we've got a bloody low there. Okay, go then. Now the AI might decide to attack me with cavalry in the farm in a second, but we'll, we'll see. We'll see. We're going to We're going to to cover. Um, and I'll tell you what, we'll change these guys back to line formation. The reason I would change in this hex, you know, um, what I want to be ideally is in the hex uh, closer to these infantry here is that sometimes when you move closer to an enemy and you end up adjacent to them, certainly if you couldn't see them and you went up over a hill and they sort of surprised you, you will lose all your movement points in an instant. Then you can't change formation. So sometimes it's better to change formation out here, so we can go into line, um, and then, okay, we don't have enough movement points to go forward. Um, but sometimes that would be the case. Maybe if he wasn't there, the movement points would be able to will be enough in order for us to get actually up to him. Okay then. Right, we've got some routed or routed skirmishers, enemy skirmishers behind our lines. Um, I'm going to be a little bit cruel here just because I haven't shown you the charge function yet or how to attack with um, cavalry. Nice, it's a, it's a squadron so we'll use them. If we select that squadron and we come up here and we go to change to charging. It now has changed our infantry here, our, our cavalry to say charging. That means they are on the charge. We're going to get a massive bonus when we come to attack these poor little skirmishers in a second. What we have to do is move up using the right click button of the adjacent hex. We've still used some movement points, we're still charging. Now, if I was to click on these uh, skirmishers, it's going to ch change to the melee box, or the attack box if you like, um, and then we're going to see what happens. So, unknown melee guards, reserve melee. Okay, they managed to take four of us, it was a very poor dice roll that. Um, and none of them. Okay, the skirmishers are a loose order formation, uh, there wasn't many of them running around. So sort of do that. However, it does say we can continue. So with charging, because of the, the weight of the charge, if you like, um, what we can do is still continue that charge, usually for a, normally up to um, three times. However, each subsequent charge after the first, you're going to have a little bit of penalty. Um, I think that's because we went up and over uh, some terrain there as well, that probably had an effect, and, and the net result is we're disordered. So we're not A, we're not going to be as effective because A, we're now disordered, and B, that took a little bit out of the horses and men there. The horses will be a little bit more blown than they were initially, but just for um, demonstration's sake, we will do it. So, it'll reselect our units, re click on those skirmishers, and then also 
but we managed to <laughs> managed to get one of them that time. And there we go. There's the third time. We can continue and just to prove that it works. Do the same again. So we've actually overrun them in that, way, in that case. They surrendered for all intents and purposes. So we will get the points in the bag for this now. Um, however, uh, oh, and if we overrun, that doesn't count towards that three times or three consecutive times we can continue in our charge. However. What we can't do is charge anywhere now because we've only got one unit, uh, one movement point, um, and there's nothing to actually uh, to attack that's adjacent to us. Another word with charging as well: you must or you can't change direction once you're charging. You can only charge in the direction or general direction that your cavalry are facing. Um, so, for example, if I was this cavalry here, my chasseur are uh, chevals, and for the sake of argument this uh, supply wagon was something I wanted to charge, I couldn't then press charge and then turn the cavalry around to charge it, I would have to start off in the direction of that supply wagon. So we carry on, moving everybody up here, and then this horse I tell you here as well. Okay, let's go to there. in here and I'm going to melee with a leader. Once, because we've got a leader there we're going to have a more organised and more powerful melee than to get them lads going and then we would have without a leader. An attacking bonus if you like. Right click on that. Press down to the farm. Um, uh, what we can't do now um, if I wanted to attack the skirmishers here with that unit that had previously fired before, because we don't have multiple melee um, or infantry melee enabled because it's unrealistic, um, somebody's already basically meleeed or attacked these skirmishers, so another unit can't do it. So I have to double click there. It says no attacking unit. Oh, yeah. Double click. Multiple infantry melee will not in effect, so we can't do it. We could do it with cavalry, as we've just seen, but we can't do it with infantry because of that uh, optional rule. Uh, so they fired uh, their staff, so we're not too worried about them. Uh, sandpit's open, so I'm going to take Sandpit. So I'm predicting here because we've got 10 movement points and so far everything's taken sort of 7 to move 1 hex. Because we're going to be adjacent to an enemy unit, there's a chance that our movement will actually go to zero. There we go. Um, might as well fire up staff. Um, a bit open down there, so. Guys up and okay. Oh, I've got some line troops there, so what I'll do is break them into skirmishes and just give ourselves a little bit more protection there. Right, I think we're going to have to go into square. So just to protect our infantry a, a, a little bit, and don't forget that skirmishes, as you saw down here, when we attacked, even. Disordered, routed, uh, there's only 50 of them, enemy skirmishers. Cavalry can be very, very effective or quite ineffective against skirmishers. If cavalry charge skirmishers, it's, it's game over, high chance of them actually being overrun in their entirety. However, pushing them back, uh, as you saw, doesn't always um, result in high casualties. I'd rather lose a couple of skirmishers than I would having uh, my main uh, brigade. Disordered uh, routes of those up here. I'm going to put them up here. Uh, and they can't move um, towards a, a enemy casualty, uh, cavalry. They're not that daft to move in, the, in an adjacent pack. So what I will do though is change these guys out to square. And as with anything, it's another movement, so that's going to cost us some movement points. This light infantry as well. Move them forward. 
don't have enough to move into square, or enough movement points to move into square. Bring these guys. Um, I'll put these guys in line. With a line formation, as opposed to column, uh, line gives you a very nice amount of firepower. So there's what, 500 men there, and the French usually split their lines into three. So we're talking about what, 150, 100, somewhere 180, something like that. Muskets all in a line firing at once, and the guys behind them. So we're talking about 360 odd muskets. But it's used two lines, so you get even higher uh, volley fire, if you like. Column's good for packing punch, as you saw, for moving around and things like that. The French like to have their columns. Um, you can still fire, but with reduced firepower. Um, um, but the, I'd say a a column is slightly better for attacking infantry, uh, for meleeing infantry. Square, um, that's got all round 360 degree arc of fire. It's not very effective against infantry, very effective against cavalry. So, interesting note, sometimes with uh, cavalry as well, if you're in line formation, it's risky for ca cavalry to actually come anywhere near you, especially if they're disordered or they're not on the charge, just because that's a hell of a lot of firepower to bring to bear on any unit, including cavalry. Um, we might be able to do that and show you here. So I'm going to ignore that skirmisher. I'm going to change this unit into line formation and bring them uh, so they're facing that cavalry. And we'll take a shot on this cover. Uh, so I didn't actually see how many we got there. We'll do it with these guys. Eighteen. It's quite a lot. It's quite a lot for one volley. Uh, okay. So these guys, they're disordered. We've got a lead or nays up here. We're going to bring them back to nay. Um, and they are now in a, a protected hex, if you like. Uh, so that cavalry shouldn't come anywhere near them. But it's a tiller game. I wouldn't be surprised if they do bring him up. Or just so they can sort of sort themselves out and they can get them all back in order. Um, and they'll be good as, a, for a, as an effective fighting unit again. Um, what we got here? Right, let's bring our cavalry and wheel them around then. So, so he's going to come up here and we're going to give him the first task. Right, so it would have been better to actually go on the road there just because when they go over this uh, sort of ridge line, it disorders them. There'll be a disorder check uh, when I do the next turn just to see, hopefully, hopefully, if they're disordered. Um, I probably could actually, oh no, there's no movement points here, but as I said, you've got to be facing the units that you want to charge if you've got the charge um, ability next turn. If we're disordered, we will not be allowed to charge. Same as if we're in an obstructed uh, hex or, or terrain, we won't be able to charge there, like forest and stuff like that. However, these are lined up potentially for quite a nice charge next time. Uh, so Pile, you go up here. Ah, so skip road. Alright, hopefully. Maybe not fully the next turn, however, the turn after that, hopefully, uh, we'll be able to bring that cavalry to bear. So, again, that's pretty much all we can do here. Um, I'm a little bit worried how open it is here. Um, but we do have some infantry there, so we'll see what Wellington does next.
So, a couple of interesting things there. First of all, here come the greys. Um, I, I thought, I, for some reason, I had a feeling they'd be around. Never mind. Um, I, I said about the AI, they decided to attack us in the village. They had no chance uh, doing that. Um, but they decided to go for it anyway. Um, and, yeah, so we'll see what we got. So, build up here. There's more troops than I initially thought. It's good at hiding these troops is one thing. Right, start with artillery again and see what they can see. Uh, oh, so they're quite close. Hopefully. That serves you right. I haven't got these guys. Um, you can see these heavies, by the way. So the power okay. uh, that's what it is. Doesn't take too many. And up here. So that's artillery done. That's it. And we'll start left to right again as well. So, I'm going to bring these guys forward in line formation. But remember, because they're in line formation, there's a high chance that they can get disordered. Which they did. Just probably because of proximity to uh, those enemy skirmishers and all these guys up here. And we'll have a go at them. Uh, I'm going to move my artillery, uh, my cavalry, face like that, ready for a charge to the next turn. So, these guys. I could put these guys into line formation in the farm. It's one of the... You get more firepower as we discussed there, especially with all that cavalry around. However, in a, a town or a village or something like that, infantry would not have gone into line formation. Um, they'd have gone into something like an open order formation where people are occupying all those buildings and stuff like that. And we can see on Lahey Singh that it's been really really nicely drawn up on this hand drawn map to represent uh, how it pretty much looks um, and we can see it's more or less a square so pe uh, the troops would have occupied all those building spaces in and out um, and if we go over here we can see um, Papalo is the same the generic buildings that's one thing I didn't like with the new maps just the all the houses and stuff tend to be very generic but they have put in specific buildings for uh, specific parts like Klasmar, the church and stuff like that um, but it's just, that's just one of those things however what I'm trying to say is the formations in the town hexes the most realistic if you think about it is actually a square formation because as we said a square formation like that looking out through 360 degrees is the best representation of a loose order formation in in a, a town or a village or something like that. However, because it's classed as an obstructed hex, we can't actually go into square formation um, in the game anyway in an obstructed hex. So I don't normally like to play with this. So, um, I use it as a house rule. We don't do that. But I'm going to go into square uh, into line formation there, just so I can bring about more guns for the sake of argument. Okay. Uh, this. Um, ignore these guys because there's a much juicier target up here. Now, we've got limbered artillery. We've got line troops that are within striking distance of them. However, I find artillery, be it limbered or unlimbered, is superhuman in John Tiller games and you can have charging cavalry against unlimbered artillery in the open without a leader, unobstructed hex and come off the worst. So the artillery men have definitely had their weak bits in John Tiller games. Uh, so we're going to give it a go and see what happens. I predict that's Wellington, maybe um, the Orange Prince and Van Alten possibly. So we're going up there. We still retain some moving points. 
We'll soften them up with a volley. And then we'll have a go at this artillery. Ah, so we pushed them back. We did take out, hopefully, one or two of their guns. Uh, oh, and it wasn't Wellington. Where is it? That's Wellington. Um, so we did push them back. Uh, we didn't disorder them or anything like that. Um, and possibly uh, they lost one of their guns, or one or two of their guns. Um, and there's our, our objective hex. Alright, we're going to move these guys forwards. And fire that. I'm not going to move them, and just because quite open here. All we've got in between this lot is uh, not too bad. Anyway. Alright, there's quite a lot of them. And these skirmishes up and give ourselves a bit more protection. Bring that up. Um, I'm gonna bring my skirmish line in here. Um, they've done their job, they gave us a, a chance Getting square, these guys. Yeah. So they gave us a chance. They did their job in the skirmish line. They protected the, the main units just so we could actually get them into square. Now what we can do is actually move a square formation. Um, it's a bit unwieldy. There's a high chance of being disordered. Uh, it wouldn't really happen in real life, um, but we do have the ability to do that, or that do have the option to do that. But we're going to leave them as it is. Now we can select square. Um, fire. What we can't do with a square formation is actually melee, so um, you know that it just wouldn't happen. It just wouldn't happen at all. We got their duel on. Because they're heavies and there's 500 of them and the dragoon guards, I'm going to bring duel on up into the square and bolster them for a little bit. Um, bring these lances up here. I think now. Take that artillery out. And get on their flank. So we bring the lances up here, face them that way, just because hopefully that uh, the uh, cavalry end up in one of these three hexes here, we'll be poised to make a charge. Um, and we'll bring these lances somewhere in the middle just to see what happens up here. First low ammo there. Remember what we said about low ammo? These guys cannot offensively fire next time until we uh, get a, a supply cart up with them. Um, but what they can do is defensive fire. So if anybody fires on them, they can fire back. Annoyingly, we've got some skirmishers uh, back here. Um, we'll have these guys come up. That's one thing, if, if you make a mistake like that, um, I sort of rushed and they've already been um, meleeed against. If I try to do it again, it goes back into defensive fire. It sort of punishes your mistake, so well done, John Tiller, on that one. Um, have a go with these. Uh, we'll put these guys in line. About face. So by all accounts, I should really be in square. But these are light dragoons, um, and I'm risking it just by having all that amount of fire there. That's you know potentially a couple of hundred muskets to try and to route them to try and take away as much of their power as possible. Same with these guys. Ah, they're low ammo, so we can't actually do anything with them. However, right, what we can do, as we see here, we've got 400 of them coming up here. I'm going to risk a charge here with these guys. Enough leaders. Has everyone got a leader? No. So you are first brigade. So you go with them. Over there. You are facing. We'll have a crack here. So, we're going to charging. 
The annoying thing is I'm going to have to go over these uh, sort of mounds, so I'm probably going to be disordered, it's going to take away a little bit of the charge. However, uh, risk against reward, hopefully attacking these guys more or less from behind from their poor quarter, the uh, left back, um, hopefully we'll be able to do some damage with them. So, let's see how we go. <laughs> yep, so that was a bit of a failure there. Um, which is surprising because, you know, they're hussars, I suppose. Um, never mind. So, these guys have actually sorted themselves out. Well done, they. What we're going to do is uh, put them into a line formation. Again, it's unrealistic in the town. Um, and then, ah, oh, I forgot to press the pro proper button. Never mind. What I do have to protect now, though, is this fire wagon with these, uh, with this cavalry around. So, I know these guys have low ammo. I'm just going to bring it a little bit more out the reach of these potential, uh, or this this cavalry up here. Anything else we can do? We have another low ammo somewhere else. So we can bring this fire wagon up. We'll get Napoleon into the fray a little bit, just so he's got some some influence, and hopefully it will rub off on everyone. Actually, we'll put them in the lances, just in case these little skirmishers here. That routed unit, they can go up like here somewhere. And again, that's near enough all we can do. So we see our fired units, and we can see. Oh, we still got something here. We'll put them into line, and we'll have a go at the guys on the ridge. See them? Can't. Yeah, we'll bring them in a little. Uh, no, we won't. We'll have a go at the cavalry. And um, we'll see what Wellington does. Interesting turn. I was just going to mention that some of the AI moves are beyond logic. What they do, they just—I mean, uh, this cavalry here, yes, and this cavalry here, but nowhere near. And they've gone into square. Never mind, it's no problem. Um, the AI is the AI is um, it is scripted, um, where you can basically tell them to go and attack that place, and the AI will sort it out as best it can. It, it's like I keep saying, it's to provide provide you with an opponent. So a lot of people knock it, but I think that's a little bit unfair. Um, and as I always say with these games, when you start playing against another human opponent, this game comes into its own. It takes it to the next level. It's, it's how it should be played, in my opinion. Um, so I'll probably give it another turn then, um, just so I don't keep you guys all day. Um, and hopefully we'll be able to maybe bring some cavalry around to bear and have a look at what he's doing with his cavalry and, and try and sort a bit of a mess out. Like I said, I'm not bothered about winning. Um, it's just to show um, all the features, or the basic features anyway, um, and how, you, or how I would play John Tiller. Right, so, back to artillery. We'll start with artillery again. One of these guys. Uh, we'll Okay. 
and these are light guns. Right, another thing about art artillery while we're on it here. Um, we've got two or three different types of artillery. We have light guns, we've got heavy guns, and we've got horse artillery. So if we were to have a look here, we've got horse artillery. They are designed to be mobile cannon around the battlefield. Um, everything, everything is um, horse drawn, including for the um, artillerymen themselves. So they're very mobile. To that end, they tend to have more movement points than a uh, a light gun or a heavy gun, um, and they have a unique functional capability, if you like, of when you limber and unlimber a gun they can fire on the same turn that you've moved and unlimbered. So if I was to limber this guy up, I know he's fired now, move him over here, unlimber on the same turn, don't have enough movement points, but on the same turn, um, I could actually fire. With the bigger, more cumbersome guns, the light guns and the heavy guns, you can move unlimber and have to wait until the next turn in order to fire. The same applies though if we have a gun here, for example, it's a light gun, not force artillery. If I was to change the direction of this gun, I might as well do it here now. Um, so it's, he's facing over here, you see our arrow, so he's facing over here. What we cannot do is, as it says down in the bottom left, only horse artillery and ships can move and fire in the same turn. So I have to now wait until my next turn. It took a lot of uh, manpower and dragging and things to actually change the direction of the gun. Whereas horse artillery, as we said, they're a lot more mobile. Um, so you can fire on the same turn with horse artillery um, as you move or change direction. With light guns, you cannot, or heavy guns, you cannot. Um, so it's all a bit of a mess. So somehow the Scots Dragoons and the, <laughs> the Royals have all ended up in the north part of La Haye Sand. Never mind. It's okay. Bring these guys around. Right, a bit risky. However, we go up. We need to recover a little bit. That definitely needs to come out of the way. Um, what will happen though? When uh, I know we're, we're quite open here, did have concern about that, but. When they move, or if they come up over on top of this sort of high ground, next time, opportunity fire from that cannon, and we'll move our line infantry around. We need to move them, but we'll put them in square as well, just in case. Now, what we have done is our lancers are now in a nice position to actually charge these heavies from the side. We'll soften them up as much as we can with some fire. Support. Skirmishers. No. Not having the best of this. Okay, so I'm going to charge. Side and uh, see how we get on. <laughs> okay, uh, strange dice roll that. Um, maybe in the comments, I, there's something I sometimes miss with cavalry. Uh, that was fairly open ground. They were they had a leader there. I had two leaders. They were charging uh, undisrupted, and these guys were disordered. And the numbers um, it was about 350. So there wasn't a huge amount of disparity there. They, they've been softened up. That to me is a strange dice roll. 63 attacker, one defender. Okay, never mind. Um, we'll go up here. These guys have low ammo. Bring him up there. Like that.
uh, and they're also low ammo. Um, okay, these guys sorted themselves out. They will go into uh, disrupted again because we've got to go over this uh, mound and then that mound as well. And it didn't work out so well last time. But we'll see if the dice is going to be a little bit more generous to us this time. Chain charging. And see where we go. Right, we'll get these Sassars against these guys, these like Dragoons now. We should have enough movement points to actually get there on the charge. Uh, they've been softened up quite nicely, they haven't moved, uh, they've had a couple of continuous volleys against them. So, open ground, leader, 375 against maximum 299. They're isolated, they're disordered, they're without a leader. If we don't win this one, I'm switching this off. There we go. Yeah, that was a little bit better, that one. Um, who have we got that's moved? So, these guys can move as well. Um, although... Oh, I'm not doing another turn, so it doesn't really matter. Right, these guys. Right, we'll have a look how we're getting on there. So at any time during the game, and right at the end when it gives you the victory or loss screen, um, you can view how many points you've got, how many people, uh, or how many soldiers you've lost, how many casualties you've inflicted, etc. Uh, if we go in here to info, and we go to victory, here we can see that we don't have any objective points, haven't managed to get any objectives yet. Um, we've lost 650 infantry, we've lost 165 cavalry, um, and the allies have lost 262 men and 556. So at the minute, I've got a total of 78 points, just, just because of the disparity in units lost. You get more for cavalry than you do for infantry, for example. Um, but I haven't taken any victory points. I would say if I was to play this scenario out in full, it's all about those two objective points. Sometimes it's, it's more a case of you've got to basically eliminate and wipe out the, your enemy from the map rather than have any objective points because you'll see they're worth sort of 10, 15, 20 points. It's, it's hardly worth getting them to a certain extent. Um, and it's all about numbers. Getting, uh, I'm playing a, a Leipzig uh, Battle of Nations uh, against the guy and I, I think I've got about a 14,500 point deficit. The objectives themselves, even though there's quite a few of them, they're just not really worth my time getting because they're only worth a few points. It's all about trying to to get rid of that 14,000 deficit and trying to get a 15,000 um, positive on my side. So it's hard work. So it all depends on, on the scenario, but it, all, it is all weighted historically. So I'm going to leave that as it is. Hopefully it's uh, it's helped people that are brand new to the John Tiller series. Um, and for those that have played other John Tiller games, but as you can see, that once you learn one, you pretty much learn them all. It's sort of intuitive as to where you go for all the different functions and buttons and things like that. And um, it, it's fairly common sense. It's intuitive as to where you find everything. Um, hopefully I've highlighted maybe, or hopefully, the differences from the Seven Year War games and the uh, American Civil War games and the Panzer Campaign games, which are completely different. Um, and you get an idea of what it was like to, to play or to fight in the age of Poland and stuff like that. Okay guys, I'll sign off then.